Welcome everybody to Convoluted. I'm Jesse Asher and today I am bringing you an interview that I did with Gary Jacobs up in Long Island, New York. Gary Jacobs is the president of Americans for Legal Reform. He's also the owner of Long Island Backstory, which you can YouTube and or Google. I sat down with Gary before an event that he was hosting and we did this interview where he kind of talks about Americans for Legal Reform. He talks a little bit about his life and also what he hopes to see with changes made in the justice system. So I hope you enjoy it and uh, leave a comment if you do. Great. I'm Gary Jacobs from Long Island, New York, and I'm the president of Americans for Legal Reform and also the host of Long Island Backstory. Uh, first, I want to know about Long, uh, Long Island Backstory. Can you tell me a little bit about that? Sure. Well, I went through a, a contested divorce uh, probably 15 years ago, and one of the biggest problems that I found with the uh, corruption in the court system was there was, there was no way to get your story out, and I felt like anybody who was around me who hadn't been through it didn't understand it. Finally, I met some people who let me tell my story to small groups of people, and I felt better because I felt like at least I can get my, uh, my story out because in court, as many people know, when they go to court, you don't really get to speak. Only your attorney speaks. Mm -hmm. And if you try to talk, the judge will say, oh, you have an attorney. So it's getting filtered. And it's like that game, you know, uh, telephone, where one person yeah. tells one person tells one person. And by the time it gets to the end, the story is totally it's different. A whole new story by that point. Exactly. And even the lawyers, they take on the personality. So if, if, if your lawyer is aggressive, which some people want an aggressive attorney, and then you tell him your story, the way he portrays it becomes aggressive or non-aggressive or non-passionate. Mm -hmm. So it was really bothering me. And finally, somebody did a show on public access. Uh, Chris DiMaggio did a show called Families in Transition. And he let me come on the show for a half hour and tell my story. And man, I felt so good that I could tell my story. And I was going through PTSD. It's like from, therapy almost. It was, it yeah. was the best. But the good thing was I felt it was out there. I said, you know what, now it's on, it's, it goes on TV, but it's also on YouTube. Mm -hmm. And maybe my children will Google it and they'll see it. Maybe the judge will see it. Maybe the law guardian will see it and realize, hey, this is a real person. He has feelings. And you know what, there's a different side to the story. So I vow when I got out of the system that I would do whatever I can to let other people, that would be my way of helping uh, society. Because mm -hmm. everybody has to do their part to make things, uh, to make things sure. better. And I said, you know what, this is something that's not very expensive. Uh, I know how to speak and I'll put it together. And I did it and I, and I started just letting people come on the show and tell their story, sometimes while they were in court, so that maybe somebody, and people really do see it, you know? Yeah. The ex might see it, the children might, and just, you don't know who's gonna see it, you don't know who it's gonna help. You know, there's people talking, uh, coming on the show talking about uh, suicide and how they were, uh, had thoughts of suicide and how they overcame it. So I help, it helped people in that way. I just felt it helped so many people. It ended up evolving into politicians coming on, attorneys coming on, it just become like a self, a self help tool. But because it's self funded, there's, there's no ulterior motive other than to help people. You yeah. have no advertisers, nobody mm -hmm. tells me what to do, and it's really unfiltered, which I think is rare, you know, oh, now can, in, in the media. Relate. I'm yeah, doing, I, mean, I do this all on my own, right? and the reason I started doing this all on my own, because I had other projects that I used to do with other people, I did not like having the no sense of control in this, you know, I liked being able to have my control, my freedom, and like you said, unfiltered, right. do, do what I want, and let, People express it's themselves. such a big difference yeah. when you could talk without in the back of your head thinking, mm -hmm. oh, is the person who gave me money going to be upset? Am yeah. I going to upset the judge? Am I going to upset, mm -hmm. you know, my partner? I don't have to upset anybody. Anybody gets upset too bad. It's my and it's my feelings. It's my truth. So, you know, I, it shouldn't be filtered. It should be what I what I feel. So where can people find Long Island? So Backstory? Long Island back the best place to find it really because on Long Island it only goes on uh, on TV on Channel okay. Twenty once a week. But because of the uh, the internet, it's on YouTube. So if you just Google Long Island Backstory, okay, uh, I probably one hundred and fifty to two hundred episodes will come up, and it's great that they're there forever. Yeah, it's you know, the it's beauty the, of electronics. It now. is. <laughs> it absolutely is. I you know when I went through this almost twenty years ago, this wasn't popular, and and I said you know what this is why corruption was able to. Uh, take hold yeah. because everybody who went before a corrupt judge or a corrupt corrupt DA or a corrupt prosecutor They thought they were the only one they mm -hmm. didn't know you couldn't you didn't how would you ever meet other people? But then comes along Facebook and Twitter and all of a sudden they set up groups and people say wait a minute 
I had that judge. I had that prosecutor. I had I had this a police officer. They planted evidence. They coerced me. They lied in court. And then it gets together. And now, you know what? One person, they think you're crazy. Two people, they think, ah, okay, maybe, maybe he found another crazy person. But when you get 10 or 15 people saying, yeah. this DA is bad, this prosecutor is bad, then people start to pay attention. It's, it's universal exposure. Absolutely. It's, that's the beauty of having cell phones now. It's Yeah, yep. everybody's on them all the time. But yep. you can film and see everything. And you can hear other people's stories. And it's exactly like you're saying. It's like, yeah, back in the day, then you didn't know that other people had this issue, right. too. But now it's you can see it everywhere. And the judges, and in my case, the judges thrived on it. Yeah. That, like, I had never been to court in my life before my divorce. So I didn't know what to experience. I didn't know what was normal. You know, I thought all judges would get up there and scream at you mm -hmm. and disrespect you and violate your constitutional rights. And that's just the way it is. But then now I realize that there are good judges and there's a lot of bad judges yeah, out there, too. Unfortunately. You know, for, exactly. But mm -hmm. you know what? At least we can expose them, which is why one of the things that we advocate for in Americans for Legal Reform is cameras in the court. To okay, me, tell me about Americans for Legal Reform first, and then sure. we'll get into more about what you do with it sure. and what you guys do. So Americans for Legal Reform is the oldest legal reform group in the United States. It was founded by Carl Lance Cesera uh, over about 30 years ago now. I found them actually through the internet, through a search, and I kept scrolling, you know, when you're up all night because you're going through this horrible uh, court battle, and I'm mm -hmm. scrolling, and I found Americans for Legal Reform, and I said, you know what, he's not too far from me, he's in Huntington. And he said, a $20 membership fee, and I'll meet with you. Okay. So I went there, and I met with Carl Lance's error, and I started telling him. And he was the first person who made sense of what was going on and explained to me the situation I was in and why, no matter what I did, I couldn't get anywhere. I was just beating my head up against the wall. He said, Gary, you're not going to get anywhere, and let me tell you why. The, your, your law guardian probably donated to your judge. You know, let's start searching for your judge. I have a folder here, Gary, from your judge, Marion McNulty, of people who have come to me, fathers, saying she will never give a father custody. I had, and I finally just spoke to somebody who understood where I was coming from, mm -hmm. gave me practical, real-life advice that I wasn't paying for. You know, when you're paying an attorney, he has an ulterior yeah. motive because and they're expensive too. You know, they're, <laughs> and they get, they're, listen, if if they, I always tell people, if it's people say this attorney's great, he has a Maserati, he has a big office. It's, well, that's not good because that means his case is dragged on very long. But he if you're a, a good money. attorney, and this is matrimonial. Because the other cases, yeah. you have to be good because you get a percentage of your, your winnings, right? But matrimonial, it's opposite. There's a disincentive to settle your case. If you're a great attorney and you can go in and settle every case, the first meeting is, listen, we don't need to go to court. Let's sit down and, and, and work things out between the parties. That guy will be broke. He'll be out of business. Yeah, he's not making money. No money. You get a $5,000 retainer and be done. Yeah, but if they can it. drag it on. For years, like here, here on Long Island, they could walk out with one hundred and fifty, two hundred thousand dollars. In my case, about seven hundred thousand, okay. just for my portion of the divorce. My ex-wife, I think, claims five or six hundred. I don't recall the number, but it's almost a million dollars to get divorced. I wasn't making a million dollars. My net worth wasn't a million dollars, but the judge let it go on, and Carl kept explaining to me, "Listen, you have to take power. You have to take control." and start coming to my meetings. Americans for Legal Reform has a meeting the first Tuesday of every month at the Plainview Old Beth Page Library. And I said, but what's that going to do? He said, well, first of all, you're going to meet people. You're going to educate yourself. You have to be educated in the law. You have to be educated in what to tell your attorney, whether he's full of it or, or not. And the knowledge is the key. And the, mm -hmm. the thing is, in the system, they thrive on it. You know, like if you first get arrested, you've never been arrested in your life. You know, you say, listen, I didn't do it. I'll talk to the police. What, yeah. I didn't do anything wrong. So it's that whole uh, statistic of how most, was it like 80, 85% of people waive their Miranda mm -hmm. rights? Right. Something like that. I would have too. A hundred percent. I would have said, I didn't do it. Mm -hmm. I'll talk to anybody. You yeah. want to, you want to do a, a, a test on me, you know, a, a lie detector test. You want to speak, you want to come into my house. Now I learn. hell no, you don't do that. You know, CPS comes knocking on my door. I just come on in the house. I yeah. didn't do, I didn't do anything wrong. Next thing I know, I'm guilty of child abuse for forcing my daughter to brush her hair against her will. And they said, did you do this? I said, of course I, I did this. I, I tell her to brush her teeth. I tell her to go to school. I tell her to do a homework. Yeah, and I told parent. her, brush her. They said, well, you can't force her. And I was found guilty of uh, inadequate guardianship. It was overturned on appeal. But if I would have known what I know, I said, you know what? Get out of my house. You don't yeah. have a search warrant. Yeah. Leave my house. You don't have the right to talk. I'm not going to talk to you. So Carl taught me all these things. And the same thing with like Long Island Baxter. I said, you know what? 
when I get out, Carl, I'm going to be active. He actually wouldn't let me be active in the group at the time. He said, it'll hurt really? you. He said, I know you want to focus, but you have to focus your energy on your case. Don't, you'll help people when you get out. Yeah. And now I look back and I say, it's interesting how so many people, they do this and then they get out of the system. And whether it's with me getting through a divorce and maybe getting custody or getting a good deal, or like in, in Jeffrey's case, maybe they get exonerated, but I'm shocked how many people, after you help them, they disappear. <laughs> you know, you think they're going to be there, but, and I understand the psychology behind it is maybe, you know what, it's I just want to, they I'm kind done. of put I, it behind them. I, yeah. But I looked at it a different way. I call, they call it post, post-traumatic growth. Okay. Some people do post-traumatic stress disorder, yeah. which I went through, but after I did growth, and that's something that our mutual friend Jeffrey Deskovic did, he said, you know what, I could take my settlement and go just live in the Bahamas and never talk to anybody, mm -hmm. but he said, I can't do it. I'm a good, I know what people are suffering right now, and I have to do whatever I can to help these people who are innocent. You know, he can't sleep and whatever, you know, maybe he was chosen if you believe in a higher power, you yeah. know, maybe God said, I'm doing this to Jeff for a reason, because although he suffered, how many people has he right. helped in his He's life? Helped and so many now, and so, so many. I know it exactly continues, and, and I try in a, in a different way. I try to help, and I and I think I've helped many people. I know I've talked, uh, as a lot of people say, I've talked them off the ledge. You know, they just <laughs> need to get over that day. Some people want to commit suicide mm -hmm. just because they can't deal with this anymore. And just getting them through that day to day to yeah. day till it gets to a better point. And that's what I I try to do at Americans for Legal Reform is give people again a voice, give them not legal advice, but real life advice on how to deal with the situation, both mentally, physically, and of course through uh, attorneys, so they have another aspect. We'll sit sometimes with their attorney and listen to them, but if their attorney's there and they know that we know, it's a little bit hard to BS the person and okay. stare them down the wrong, the, the wrong road. So, so that's what we do at, at Americans for Legal Reform. We're a nonprofit. Uh, you know, our membership now is $50 a year. Uh, if you can't afford it, you don't pay it, you just become a member, and we ask that you volunteer at a barbecue that we have okay. once a year, or court watching, which for us right now is our stage in between cameras in the court, mm -hmm. because New York is dead against cameras in the court, yeah. because obviously they're trying to hide something, because otherwise, why would you why not? not? Why want not? I mean, the only person it would technically hurt would be the litigant. Mm -hmm. So if the litigant says, I want cameras there to protect me, why would the prosecutor say I don't want it? Why would the judge? It doesn't even make logical sense. You should want that transparency. Of course, it's it's the best thing. Yeah. I always said in my case, if people saw the way this judge spoke to me and trampled on my constitutional rights, yeah. they would be horrified to see that this judge was an elected official. But nobody could see it because it's transcripts. And, and you as, it's transcripts are like text. You don't the, get the context. You don't no, get the tone. You don't get you don't, the tone exactly. You, you can't. You can't read how they were saying. It's no way the yeah. same thing. I, I used to say I want to do a reenactment of my transcript <laughs> so people could hear the judge screaming at me. And and also when they do something that's wrong, there are a lot. Listen, judges are smart. They're experienced. When they do something that's wrong, off the record. Yep. Yep. <laughs> now all of a sudden yep. it's off the record. The transcripts look like it was a beautiful case. Or they'll do a backroom conference. That that's mm -hmm. a big one too. And they'll trample on your rights in the conference. And the lawyers know, don't repeat what, what happened back there because the judge will deny it and you'll be in bad shape with sure. the judge. So uh, cameras in the court, to me, there shouldn't be any backroom conferences unless they're all upon consent. And everything should be cameras in the court. There's no reason for there not to be cameras. But what, like what you're doing here, letting people go out and say, okay, here is what happened in court. Is, yeah. is, is a good step or having court watchers you know if you have 15 people sitting in the courtroom taking notes that that makes a big difference too people act differently they can't they you act can better. put little note like put little asterisks next to it and be like he yelled this exactly part. Like, even it's something just, like that when people i'm telling you i see the behavior of judges and attorneys change when there's 15 20 people they also don't know who those people mm -hmm. are so when they see those people, they, they really do act differently when there's two or three people in the back and the litigants. It's a totally different ballgame. It's, it's kind of like having your boss at work over your shoulder. You do the best job you can. Well, the people are the boss in this situation. And so if they can see and witness it all the way it's supposed to be, then they're going to do their job a little bit better. Yeah, more I'm proper. using your analogy because that, that is an amazing, yeah. that really is the best analogy. Steal it, it's all yours. I'm, I'm going to use it, thank you. <laughs> I, I, I give you credit, but now it's memorialized. So That's how everybody I mean, knows it came from everybody you. Everybody knows that. And it's, you know, if, at my old day job, I always do my stuff normal how I'm supposed to do it. But of course you have that added pressure if the boss is right there right. with you. Right. And that's exactly how I, how I feel like you're kind of portraying it. Is like 100%. The, the people, they, everybody is the boss of you know, prosecutors, DAs, whatever. And if they have that pressure of knowing that they're going to be watched, 
and analyzed, then they're going to perform their job the way they're supposed to perform. Right. 100%. So that makes sense. Yeah, yeah that's 100 percent true. So before we close out, last couple things I want to ask you is one, uh, like you mentioned, Jeffy Deskovich, how, Deskovich, how do you guys know each other? How are you affiliated? So I met Jeff. Some uh, a mutual friend asked him to speak at one of our American. Actually, they invited me to go watch him speak. I invited him to come to one of our meetings, and I said, you know what, this man, besides, you know, listen, you can listen to his story. And I hate to say the word story because when yeah. you say here, it's not a story, it's his life. It, the was, man, it really happened. It's, it's real life. And to Jeff, it's not a story, it's his life. But for lack of a better term, when I heard his story, it was just so inspirational to me. And, you know, I went through tough times and I was angry. I really was angry. I was angry at my ex-wife. I was angry at the judge. And listen, I would still love to see them both drop dead, but that's out of my control. <laughs> but I would like almost be obsessed with it saying, you know what? Why is it that they're just, my judge gets to go home at night and be with her family when she destroyed my family, destroyed my future, my ex-wife destroyed not only my life, but destroyed my kids' lives. And it just, it was always like just under the surface. And I asked Jeff in one of his meetings when he, he uh, after he spoke, I said, Jeff, how do you, how are you not so angry? Like you, you were just, I'm angry for you. Yeah, how are you not bitter? Right. And he said, you know what? They already took 16 years of my life. I'm not letting them take any more. And uh, I said, you know what, if Jeff can do that, because what happened to me sucks, it really did suck, but it's nothing like what happened yeah. to Jeff. And I said, you know what, if he's the kind of man that can do it, I'm going to be like him. And I, I'm not smart enough to go to law school and, and do what he did, so I do it in my way, which is with my show, Americans for Legal Reform, advocating for people. And Jeff does it in his way mm -hmm. because he, you know, he's, uh, you know, better. I don't even know how he managed to do that. And again, how do you go to school after being in prison for that long and and try to pick up again and, and just such amazing accomplishments in his life and again jeff can go away he can just say you know what i'll do a couple speaking engagements people can pay me and he doesn't have to do mm -hmm. this i mean imagine he's doing it for no other reason but to help people he's not doing it for the money the he's genuine. not doing it for, i mean something from the heart so to me that was so inspirational mm -hmm. and uh originally i was like you know what this guy needs a friend because at the beginning, I don't remember if he even had a settlement back then. He wasn't an attorney. You know, people didn't really, he wasn't a national figure that, that he is now. But I said, you know, this guy, he was done wrong by, by, by society. And I want to befriend him. And then, you know, I got to know him. I'm like, this is an amazing, he's really an amazing, amazing man. He really, so he's just inspirational on so many levels. So, yeah, so, it, so, so I just really, you know, I, I follow Jeff. I learn from him. I think of Jeff as, as, a, as a mentor, as a role model. And I, and I try to let other people hear him speak as much as possible. Because, you know, if, if Jeff can do it, anybody can do it. If Jeff can, I mean, Jeff was, you know, when people go through a bad divorce, they're at the bottom of their their mm -hmm. life. They've lost, they may have lost their kids. They lost their husband or their wife. They lost their house, their money. They've been accused of crimes that they didn't commit. I mean, you're at the lowest point. And so it's very hard to, to get up from that point. But I say, you know what, if Jeff can get up from being in prison, possibly spending his life in, in, in jail, having family members and friends just forget about him and let him die there like he never existed, and to still. getting out, it's just, it's, it's, it's unbelievable that he did it. Really, you think about it. Just how unbelievable it is to go. So if Jeff can do it, anybody can do it. It's the courage that, that it takes. Like, not everybody has that. Some no. people either push or they just kind of succumb to where they like succumb to their environment and just kind of. Well, it's much easier to say, it. right? It's much easier to just say, you know what? Life did me wrong. Yeah. I got screwed. I don't know why. God hates me. You know, I have bad so, luck. I have a curse over me. I don't know why. Speaking of bad luck or you know what's been brought upon you talk to me about the false accusations a little sure. bit and just how that kind of tore the family apart and how and kind of slide transitioning into that what are i would say like what are your like top three reforms that you would like to see right. in our criminal well justice false system? allegations that's one of, and one of the things that jeff and i speak about because of course his case was the extreme you know he yeah. was accused of uh of murder but imagine if you can be falsely accused of a rape and murder and you could go to prison when you didn't do it imagine mm -hmm. when somebody makes a lesser allegation they say you know what we're just going to say he did it because the person's usually not going to jail. So, for example, in my case, the first thing, and I had private investigators, so I actually knew it was coming, believe it or not. I knew my private investigators, listen, we sat next to your wife in a bar and we heard her talking and we know what's about to happen. She's going to accuse you. She wants to get you out of the house and she's going to accuse you of doing something. She's going to try to get you to do it, but if you don't do it, she's just going to accuse you of doing Either it. Way. Sure enough, a week later. 
She called the police, she started a fight, and of course I didn't touch her, I never had touched her, I had actually had a recording, because I knew it was coming, so I was recording it. And uh, she called the police and said that uh, I grabbed her wrists and I pulled her towards her, towards me and I made sucking noises and scared the hell out of her where she was fearful of her life and my kids were present so that the order of protection would extend to my children. And that was my first experience in having my rights trampled yeah. away. The, the sheriff showed up, they took me out of the house and said, you can't speak to your kids, you can't go near your house, you can't go near the school, you can't do this. You, I'm like, what do you mean? All I, because of a false accusation. Because I was never even in court. She went and did it mm -hmm. on her own. They, they call it, uh, what do they call it? Um, Ex parte. Okay. They called, she went there ex parte on her own, made these allegations without me being there. And they gave me a court date for two weeks away. And let me tell you, you don't know, I didn't think about my constitutional rights before this. I'm an American. I have my rights. You know, until they're taken away. Yeah. You know, I, I didn't own a gun. I said, I don't need a gun. But when your rights are taken away and your freedom is taken away, now you can have a gun because that's part of the deal. You can't leave the country. You can't have your passport. You know, you can't go in your own house that you paid for for 15 years. You can't see your own children, your flesh, because of a false allegation. No evidence, no proof, no, Not even no there nothing. to defend myself. So I did go back to court and I said, I want my day in court. I was guilty, innocent until proven guilty. And the judge said, you've already caused enough trouble, Mr. Jacobs. You'll stay away from that house till we have our trial. And in one week went to two weeks, to three weeks, to four weeks, to five weeks, to six weeks without my rights. And I said, what happened to speedy trial? Mm -hmm. oh, speedy trial doesn't count in family court, only in criminal court. And I said, but wait a minute, isn't losing my house and my children as important as being put in prison? Well, it was essentially stolen from you. How and is that not criminal? They said, no, because the way it's set up is, is that they don't do it. In fact, they can put you in jail in family court for 18 months without a jury, with one judge oh, wow. and no jury. It's scary. And this is why we have to fight for our constitutional rights. And mm -hmm. if you don't fight for them, they're going to be taken away. And that's why I went out and I got a gun. I said, you know what? That's my right. I do free freedom of speech and I fight for it. And people say, well, why, do you, why are you doing this? It's my right as an American. And if you don't do it, you're going to lose it. Mm -hmm. You know, if you don't fight for that speedy trial, you're going to lose it. If you don't fight for due process, you're going to lose it. So there's a lot of crossover. I mean, as again, Jeff's case, you know, these are much more severe. They're, they're uh, allegations of murder. Mm -hmm. But if somebody can go to jail for a murder they didn't commit, Imagine how somebody, they, they hand these orders of protection out like candy. Mm -hmm. that we, that's the joke we say, but it's not a joke. But this is, they mean, hand though. them out like candy. Anybody can go into court. You say the keywords. Yeah. I'm fearful. They scared me. They did this. Now you have an order of protection and your rights are taken away. And I take mm -hmm. that very, very seriously. And we have to fight for it. I, was, I, I believe the number was 13 times I had false allegations made against oh me. Oh, my goodness. And I kept saying, wait a minute. What happened to the first time? The second time I was found not guilty or they dropped it every time. They said, everyone stands on its own. And you might get a different judge. And they would take it seriously again. It's a whole so, new one to them. Yeah. And this is how, and, and I see now, like people would say, how could Jeff... Uh, Take a plea. How could he, you know, people take pleas. They, they told me, listen, just take a plea. Just say you did it. And yeah, you won't get to see your kids without a supervisor, but it'll go away. And it doesn't really mean you did it. They, it's like a no contest thing because you're consenting. But it wasn't true. Once I did it, they could say that I did it because I took a plea. And me, as a smart guy, was almost willing to sign a paper saying I did this. Just to make it a little because bit easier. Because they, be, they said it'll be worse for you. They said, listen, yeah. you're going to be convicted. There's no jury. They're gonna. All she has to do is get up there and cry, and say he did it. The judge believes her, and that's it. You're done. You have an order of protection for five years. You lose custody of your kids, and you're out of your house. I said maybe I'm gonna do it. I called the lawyer. He said, Why would you take a plea for something you didn't do? Yeah. How will you put your head on your pillow at night? Go in there and fight it. And if you lose, you could appeal it. But at least you can go to sleep or go to jail or at leave, least knowing that yeah. you fought because it's the you worst can feeling. Say that, and know. I did it, and I won. Good. And after that, but I tell you, don't, but I see how people, imagine somebody says, listen, just say you did it, because if you go to court and you lose, you're going to spend 15 years in prison. What do you want to do? Would you rather spend five years in prison, guaranteed, or 15 to 20 if you lose, which you're probably going to lose? What do you do? And I could see how people now would do this. I yeah, mean, it's, it's a just, rock and a hard place. <laughs> what you, even the death penalty, honestly, before this whole thing, before I met Jeff, I was a staunch death penalty. I'm like, if they did it, and they went to trial, and they were convicted, Fry the son of a bitch. He killed somebody. Yeah. Well, that kind of bring, makes me think of, uh, are you familiar with Ron Williamson, that famous case in no. Oklahoma? John Grisham wrote a book about him. He was on death row. 
and eventually DNA exonerated him. Same thing, he had an ineffective counsel, he was, allegations were made against him, and everybody believed him pretty right. much. And he eventually fought, and he's one of the cases, one of the reasons why I am no, no longer staunchly for no. right. the death penalty, and now I am staunchly against it. Me too. Because Absolutely. there are so many cases, like Ron Williamson, there's a guy in California, uh, Benavita, I can't say his name, um, Vicente Benavides, that's it. He was on death row for like 30 something years, barely spoke English and because of false accusations and a rape and murder charge that he never did. It's just, I can't, I can't support it anymore. Right. There's too no, many examples. I can't take it. I mean, it's bad enough that they go away. And I used to be the same. I used to see a black, black kid coming out with a hoodie pulled over his head and getting marched out in the, in the row out of prison going to court. And the lawyer would say, he's innocent. He didn't do it. And I'd say, come on. They don't arrest somebody. Look at the kid. Mm -hmm. He's got a, a hoodie pulled over him. He's a thug. Of course he did it. The cops wouldn't arrest somebody who did Now my whole theory has changed. But that's how this happens. You get railroaded, you know, mm -hmm. the, the lawyer says you did it, the law guardian says you did it, the police arrested him. They say, oh, this is a bad guy. And then that becomes your, your, your whole case, your footprint is yep. this is a bad guy. He may be able to act well in court and put on a show and have a good lawyer, but he's probably a bad guy. Mm -hmm. You know, and I think even with Jeff, if he wasn't exonerated or had somebody who admitted that they committed the murder, I'm, I would be sure that there's people in the back of their mind that would say, you know what? He might have done just it. Just said yeah. he did it. He spent all that time. He probably mm -hmm. really did do it. And he just got off on a technicality. It's And it's it's true. I mean, and it's but now I know people, so I don't think like this. But I'm sure pe people would think think like this. So, uh, well, it's education. Yeah, people, it's education. People just have to learn. And I see yeah. it. I really do. I see that in, in our case, too, with divorce. Somebody will lose custody. And they'll say, ah, they probably really deserved it. Maybe yeah. they were nice in public, but maybe they were a jerk behind the scenes. Maybe they're, and that's not the, that's not the case. You know, of course it can be sometimes, mm -hmm. but you can't just take it all together. And the whole system, in my opinion, needs to be reformed. And what Jeff's doing on his end, a lot of it spills over, you know, from disclosure is a, you know, is a big thing, you know, like Brady violations. Mm -hmm. We don't really have, but, to, but we should have it. If they have proof that you did something, you should have to produce it. You can't just yeah. go in and get an ex parte order on a word. You mm -hmm. should have to show, really prove your case before they take away your constitutional rights. I mean, imagine being a law-abiding citizen, having a gun in your house and you're safe, locked up, in your house that you've been in for 20 years. Maybe your family handed it to you and the sheriff shows up at your house. Give me your gun, get out of your house, and don't go within 500 feet of it until you have court in two months. That's scary. It is. That's like Nazi Germany that they can do this. It's and it happens every single day. Or as I mentioned earlier, putting people in jail without a jury. That is freaking That's, scary. It's ridiculous. Because judges are failed lawyers for most of the time. Yeah. Most judges are going in not because they want to do the right thing. They're going in because they want to be at their end of their career. They want to get a nice pension. Mm -hmm. They want to get a nice salary. They want to be prestigious and be called judge. Um, slide it's, not, out. it's not the best of the best. Yeah. And occasionally it is. I mean, here on Long Island, I think it's gotten a little bit better where we do have some, some very good judges. But uh, the crap rises to the top here. The mm -hmm. ones that keep moving up are not the ones who are doing the right thing. That's They're the ones who are collecting money from people and who are locking people up and feeding this big monster system, which is the prison system, the, the law guardians, you know, the psychologists, the lawyers. They you gotta feed this beast. There's so much money involved with prisons and all these things that come with it, you know, and they don't realize it. you destroy somebody's life if you put them in prison for the most part. You know, you're never going to get a good job again. Again, these are just in general, but for the just, most part, yeah. you're never going to get a good job. You know, even if you get divorced and you get one of these orders of protection, it comes up all the time. Oh, have you ever been arrested? Yes. Yeah. Why? Well, because of my divorce. Well, it's unfortunate too, because a lot of employers, even if you check that box that says you've been arrested, they automatically aren't going to even take the time you're to out. interview you. Right. There's, there's, there's a hundred other people. Yeah, they're not going to gonna give you the chance to explain yourself right. and even if you do why. do they believe it no most of them aren't going to <laughs> you're not going you. to. they're going to be skeptical and all that <laughs> right. so before we close out i wanted to ask what would if you could change one thing right now to your ideal manner what would it be well for me it would be the presumption of shared parenting okay. to me no parent should lose custody of their children you created them god created them and there should be a presumption of as close to 50 50 as possible you shouldn't use children as pawns in court or money makers you know uh in the court system so it would be when you go to court there's a presumption that you're the mother you're the father and you're going to share them as equally as possible we're going to make sure that both parents can live the best they can nobody's going to be destroyed financially 
that you're never going to spend your life savings. There should be a cap on how much you can spend in, in legal fees in, in a family court case. Uh, child support should not be done strictly on income. For example, you know, I always tell people, does it, if, if you make $50,000 a year and the other person makes $300,000 a year, does it cost that much more to feed a child? The kid eats what it eats. It doesn't mm -hmm. eat more because, because so why yeah. does that person need 20% of the 300,000? And it's a disincentive for the, the non-custodial spouse to make more money mm -hmm. because the more money they make, it the decreases away. their money. And the more the other person, the more they make, the more they give away. I mean, who wants to give away 30% of your income? And what I've seen in, in other countries like Scandinavia, where they have a presumption of shared parenting, and the money is set at a fee because it only costs this much to raise a kid. Yeah. And there's no one's, the parents get along because if one person will always make more than the other, you want to be nice to them so they'll spend more on the kids. Yep. And I've, you know, they always use this deadbeat dad, and I've been doing this for a long time. And I have honestly, I'm sure they're out there. I have never met a deadbeat dad, meaning somebody who has a great relationship with their kids, sees them all the time, has money in the bank, and says, well, I'm not paying for my kid. Now, they may say, I don't want to give $100,000 a year to my kid, but nobody, it's, it's an inherent that all mothers and fathers want to take care of their children. They want to have food on their table. They want to have them get the best education. They want to have them have nice clothing. This is not, you don't need a court to force you to do this. Yeah. It's very rare that you do. So I say get the government the hell out of our lives as much as possible and take the incentive out of fighting in court. So that's, okay. my, that's my goal is the uh, is shared parenting. And how can people be involved with Americans for Legal Reform? What can they do? Mm -hmm. So well, you can find us on the internet, you can find us on Facebook, come to our meetings and protest. We do protests a couple okay. times a year. It's important that people show up because one or two crazy people screaming doesn't get anybody's attention. Two or 300 people doing a protest that all vote makes a difference. And especially in smaller towns, like or even in Long Island, you know, in county races, some of them are only won by a couple hundred votes. And mm -hmm. we can be that couple hundred votes. And, you know, that's a big difference doing it through politics. So just get involved. Do what you can do. I said not everybody can do the same thing. Not everybody can do what Jeff Deskovic did and go to law school and become a lawyer. I mean, I know I couldn't do it. I don't have the attitude You know, I'm not smart. I couldn't, re I couldn't remember. I couldn't study. I just couldn't do it. So, but what I do is so I'm, I, I do things with my mouth. I, I do my, my protests. I do my organization. I do my get-togethers. You know, other members that come in and go, listen, I want to be behind the scenes, but I make a lot of money. They put money up. They do make donations. Donations for, for people they help other people so everybody just do what they can do and if everybody does their part somehow it'll work out and things will get better and what's the website uh, www.americansforlegalreform.com awesome well thank you so much thank Gary, you so for much doing for doing this. this I appreciate and it and hopefully we'll get some people drawn to Americans for Legal I hope Reform so. and do whatever they can I hope so everybody do your part and make the world a better place thank you so much thank you